Joining us right now via Zoom chat is Dr. Peter Kwasniewski. He holds a uh, PhD from Catholic University of American Philosophy, and he's a, a scholar at the Aquinas Institute in Green Bay. And he's also been a part of the Mass of the Ages uh, film tr trilogy. I think it's going to be a trilogy, and the next release is coming out soon, and we're looking forward to that. But he is also the author of a book called True Obedience in the Catholic Church, a guide to discernment in challenging times. Dr. Peter Kwasniewski, good morning to you. Thank you for being on with us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Praise be to God. We're grateful for your time today. You know, obedience is kind of a hot button issue these days. I mean, it always has been in the church, of course, but I think many Catholics today are feeling very conflicted when it comes to obedience, obedience to Holy Church, to the Pope, to the bishops, to teaching, and, you know, in conflict with the world around us and how we interpret that. Can we start with defining some terms? What does it mean to be obedient, first as a layman, but then possibly a priest, a bishop, etc.? Yes, so obedience is the virtue by which we submit uh, our intellect and will to a superior, to one who is placed over us by God. Um, and therefore, you know, right away when you, when you define it that way, um, you have to ask, well, who is the superior? Does he really rule with God's authority? And given that only God alone is perfectly true and just and holy, and every human authority can fail and falter, uh, you have to look at what is the basis for the authority and what are the limits to it. Because every human created authority has limits. Uh, in other words, we're not obedient in regard to everything, but obedient in regard to precisely those things over which that authority has command or, or discretion. Um, so really what you could think of is obedience places us uh, into, it, it places us into a hierarchy of authority uh, whereby we, if we're a lower part of that, like a layman, we're subordinate to the next rank, who's subordinate to the next rank, to the next rank, all the way going up to God, the source of all authority. And therefore all of these lower authorities have to harmonize with divine authority. That's just a general statement. I think, I mean, myself, I'm speaking for myself here, life is easier when it's on or off. Life is easier when it's black and white. It's the nuance that becomes more complicated. And, uh, and frankly, you know, guys like me don't want to deal with that. And I think this falls into that category because it's easier, like, especially as a convert to the church, somebody who was raised uh, non-Catholic, anti-Catholic in some ways, uh, very much uh, uh, anti-Catholic. And when you come into the church, you're like, okay, I've got to give my fidelity to Holy Mother Church, especially to the Pope, et cetera. And then we find ourselves in complicated situations where you're like, wait, what did he, what, what did he just say? What, what was, what, what? I, yeah, now we're conflicted and now we, we want to avoid these conversations with friends and family. How do we respond to that? Exactly. So really, I mean, obedience, um, the way I like to, to say it is <clears throat> obedience is a very important virtue, but it's not the only virtue. Uh, there's charity, there's humility, there's the love of the truth, right? Adherence to the truth. Um, and so obedience has to be seen as, as one piece in this beautiful mosaic of the virtues that make up the Christian life. Um, and in normal circumstances, uh, when we have a leader, and, and this is true of civil authority as well as religious authority, when we have a leader who's leading well with the common good in mind and following all the, the laws that that leader should follow, uh, then normally we can actually surrender ourselves to, we don't have to think about you know every single command we don't have to parse it out and and do a complicated study of it we we should normally be able to obey and we should want to have a, a prompt readiness to obey um, but we also have to have what the tradition calls the census fidelium that is the sense of of the faithful for what the catholic faith is what it teaches so that if God forbid, but if we have a bishop who, let's say, becomes an Arian, as happened in the fourth century with just about all of the bishops or semi-Arian, you know, and the bishop is teaching something false, something heretical, we have to be able to say, you know, I'm sorry, but I can't follow you in, in that regard. I'm not going to worship with you. I'm not going to follow you because what you're teaching is false. And I know it. I know it as a baptized layman, right? So we do have to take responsibility. And God on, on the judgment day 
is not going to say, oh, it's okay, you outsourced your mind and your will to somebody else, I'm just going to judge him. No, he's going to say, you knew, you should have known and you could have known certain things that I, I, that I expect you to know and that I've told you uh, in various ways, uh, and therefore, you know, you, you do have to take responsibility for yourself. Dr. Peter Kwasniewski is our guest. His book is called True Obedience in the Church, A Guide to Discernment in Challenging Times, which is published by Sophia Institute Press, by the way. So uh, let's, uh, how do we get to the place in, we're in our timeline now where the vast majority of Catholics are appalled if you don't go, you know, with the whole gambit of the, you know, the the German synodal path is what I'm thinking about today. Like, if you don't agree that of everything that comes out of His Holiness's mouth on a Wednesday audience or an airplane interview, then you are somehow schismatic and heretic and just the evil incarnate. How do we get to that place? Well, I guess I would say <clears throat> that seems like a slight exaggeration to me. I mean, there, there definitely are some Catholics, I would say probably at this point a minority of Catholics, who hold to what you might call a hyper-papalist model, where, as you said, everything that the Pope says, uh, and is, is we have to accept it, believe it, live by it. Um, but I, I think that the reality, both in terms of Catholic history and in terms of the present moment, is that there are certain things that we ignore or that we're inclined to ignore when the Pope says, because they strike us as, because they really are, just his opinion about things, right? I mean, it doesn't require a lot of education as a Catholic to know that when the Pope is just running at the mouth on an airplane interview, I mean, it could be interesting, it could be insightful, it could be, but it's not, he's not teaching us with magisterial authority. He's not teaching us as the Supreme Shepherd laying down some rule of faith or morals, you know, that everybody has to obey. If the Pope is gonna do that, he needs to make it clearly known. That That's what Vatican I, uh, definitely expresses to us, right? If the Pope uh, speaks ex cathedra from his throne uh, and makes it known that he's binding us to a certain course of action, then we certainly had better obey that in every case. Um, but Popes have actually been rather hesitant to do that. Um, and that's because they realize that much of what they're teaching isn't, the stakes are not that high. They're not dealing with something which is a matter of salvation or damnation. <clears throat> and you can see that with like John Paul II, uh, frequently in his documents, he would even say, such and such is my opinion, you know, j just to make mm. it clear that we weren't, that he was just offering his his own, mm, let's say his own prudential judgment on the matter. So I, I think, I think though there is confusion because some Catholics really do, um, they're mistaken about the nature of authority. Uh, and authority is meant to guard the received inheritance of the Catholic faith. Right, mm. The deposit of faith, as well as the traditions of the faith, everything to do with our liturgy, for example, the Pope is obliged to receive those things and then defend them. Um, and it, it, again, it doesn't take a lot of, of knowledge of history, of Catholic Church history, to see that that's exactly how the Popes have always seen their role. Um, so that's the attitude that we need to have as well. We should be uh, receivers, grateful receivers of tradition, and then and we should obey those who also gratefully receive tradition. Let me ask you, can we, can we can you give us some examples? I was thinking as as a lay person, my obedience to my bishop is different than that of the priest to the bishop or to a religious to their superior. Um, can you give us some ideas of where we might find contradiction with our bishop where our bishop may ask us to do something, but we aren't obligated to do it? I mean, it doesn't have to be sinful or evil, just in the normal life. Are there any examples you might consider? Yes, um, I could give a few examples. One, one would be if a bishop or a pastor, because a pastor has a certain authority over his, his uh, flock, if, if he were to demand that parents enroll their children in a First Communion or a Confirmation class, uh, the parent could say, no, thank you. I'm, I'm actually educating my children at home, as is my God-given responsibility and right. Um, I'm the first educator. I'm the only natural educator of my children. Everybody else educates them uh, in a certain sense by my permission. I mean, St. Thomas is quite clear about this. Uh, and so actually, we're doing catechism at home. I'll show you what the program is. It's very thorough. You can quiz them at the end. Of course, that's your your your, your prerogative is to make sure that they're prepared. You can totally do that. But we're gonna we're gonna prepare them at home. We're quite happy to do that. That's what we all we've always done. 
Um, and the parish priest can't say, oh, no, I'll deny you the sacraments if you don't go into our CCD program. That's, that's uh-huh. a clear example. Uh, and, you know, that would be a whole separate show to talk about. That. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I didn't know that was the case because I've heard many cases where that yeah. exact thing has happened to people. And they say for sure that you have to send your kids to CCE. But it's false and it can be shown to be false by the by magisterial teaching. Wow. Um, so that's the first thing. Another example, you know, this I've also heard this where where people have been given the runaround for not putting their children into the parochial school and for mm. just for homeschooling, like as if that's mm. something that's somehow second best or or, or even a questionable dubious no that's com- that's completely fallacious um <clears throat> another example would be if a priest were to decide to celebrate the mass ad orientem now i'm talking about the novus ordo because the traditional mass has to be celebrated ad orientem but if he says i'm going to celebrate it facing east and the bishop says no you're not allowed to do that i won't let you do that that's that's completely illegitimate on the part of the bishop because it runs against the rubrics of the Novus Ordo. It runs against all of the Vatican's statements on the subject. So the bishop is simply um, he's 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 falsely he's asserting a false authority at that point. Uh, just the fact just because he's moderator of the liturgy in his diocese doesn't mean he can just disagree with universal legislation about the liturgy. Um, so that would be another example that I could give. You know, that makes me think of, you mentioned earlier of JP2's comments about, you know, I'm speaking uh, from just my own personal opinion, and Benedict XVI famously wrote his his trilogy where he signed it under Cardinal Ratzinger rather than Benedict XVI. And it made me think of the article you put out back in October about Carol Wotiwa uh, having this, IA, this, what we might consider today disobedience, but it was for a higher law. It was for the salvation of souls. It had a state of necessity. Could you speak about uh, circumstances where n- obedience may not necessarily be required because of a higher law, if, as long as you're not breaking God's law? Yes. Yeah, well, the example that you mentioned, you know, Carol Wojtyla as, as Archbishop of Krakow, um, was ordaining uh, was ordaining clergy clandestinely against the agreement that the Vatican had made with the uh, with the, the the communist authorities that such things wouldn't happen or wouldn't be done without their without their knowledge. This the so-called Ostpolitik, the, the policy of rapprochement with the communists in Eastern Europe, um, and he wasn't the only one who who at the time recognized that the Vatican's deal with the communist authorities was very much at the cost of Catholics. It was, it was to the benefit of the communists, and it was at the expense of ordinary faithful. The, I'm not saying necessarily that the Vatican's intentions were bad. Um, that's another, quest, another question entirely. Maybe we can't even decide that question. But whatever their intentions were, the actual policy on the ground was not working. It was, it was to the detriment of the Catholic Church. And a bishop who, in, in a communist country, could say to himself, you know, I have a fundamental responsibility to provide the sacraments for my faithful. That is much more important than any deal with the communist government. And I'm going to continue to do that through ordaining clergy, through confirming, through um, whatever, you know, through making sure that mass is celebrated, even if clandestinely, even, even if it's against various agreements. So really that's where, that's where the idea comes in of the hierarchy, right? Of authority, being able to see what is more important and what is less important, uh, or what is required, and what is not required or optional. Um, so St. Thomas, actually, let me just make this quick point. St. Thomas has a really nice layout in the Summa where he says there's sufficient obedience for salvation, there's perfect obedience, which, is, which he assigns only to the religious who make a vow of obedience to their superior, and then there's indiscreet obedience, which he says is too much obedience. That is obedience about the wrong things or at the wrong time or in the wrong way, um, particularly when, when a superior commands something unlawful and the, the subject goes ahead and does it because he says, well, I should be obedient. St. Thomas calls that indiscreet obedience, meaning you're not using discretion. You're not using mm. good judgment. And to speak to that, you know, we're, a lot of us are in a situation now uh, post this uh, motu proprio traditionis custodis where, you know, we we would like to continue to approach the the mass in the traditional form, uh, you know, according to 1962 or even before. And, and we're feeling as if there's uh, a disobedience there. We're being labeled as rebellious. I think also of, uh, for example, uh, the, the recent story of the Carmel in Philadelphia that's 
being forced to uh, to uh, confederate with different uh, communities. What would you say was uh, some practical advice for people who are, are kind of being labeled as rebellious or being set off to the side as uh, disobedient? Yes. Uh, and of course, my, my little book on true obedience really goes into that somewhat, although I, I do that in other writings as well. Yeah, it's a very good question. What, what we have to understand is a fundamental principle, which Pope Benedict XVI himself said very clearly. He said, what was sacred in the past remains sacred and great today and cannot be declared harmful or forbidden. Okay, that's now that statement is not just a prudential or disciplinary decision. That's a statement of fact. Mm -hmm. That's an absolute theological statement. What was sacred in the past remains sacred and great to the present cannot be forbidden or declared harmful. Okay, so basically the church, the church's traditional liturgy, which was developed and prayed by her saints for over a period of 2000 years until the liturgical reforms, this could never be something to be ashamed of, something that we should not love, something that we should not cherish, uh, something that we could be considered rebellious for loving. That's impossible. If you say that, you are cutting the branch of the Catholic Church off on mm. which you are sitting, right? Oof, <laughs> I mean, ouch. Just, just, like, just like if a pope were to mm. say, you know, by my papal authority, I declare that there is no such thing as papal authority, right? I mean, that would be, <laughs> we would recognize that as a contradiction. <laughs> well, it's not any different if a pope says, I'm using my authority to try to suppress the traditional liturgy of the Roman Church. That's he's just sawing the branch off on which he's sitting. Because if the church was wrong for so many centuries to worship in this way, and if the saints were wrong to love this liturgy, right, then why should we listen to what the Pope says today? Why should we accept his new liturgy if he's rejecting the old liturgy, right? That that makes no sense. It might be the case, it might be, I, there, there are debates about this, that a Pope could have the authority to provide an alternative right. Uh, he could provide, he could say, here's a modern version of this right, if it helps you, if it helps evangelization or whatever, but not in such a way that he's canceling out the former right. right. Yeah. That's that's never been done, and it cannot happen. Um, and really, by their fruits, you shall know them. If there's if there's a modern form of worship, and it's really successful, and it's bringing tons of people into the church, conversions, reversions, everything, then then you know, praise be Jesus Christ. I mean, this the fruits show it. But if it's having the opposite fruits, uh, which is what's happened in 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 North America and in or in the Americas and in, in Western Europe. It's having exactly the opposite fruits. It's time to re-examine and yeah. say, okay, well, maybe that those liturgical reformers, however well-intentioned they were, were really seriously mistaken. Mm. And what the church actually needs to do is to cling to her tradition and re and, and return to her tradition, right? We, so that's what I would that's what I would say. We only have about a, a minute and a half left in our conversation with Dr. Peter Kwasniewski. Can I just ask you? Recently, there's been a report out that, that the Pope is asking for FSS or wants to demand that Pope uh, that bishops make FSSP priests say the Novus Ordo on Holy Thursdays. Uh, should they be asked to do that? Forced to do that? Could they say no? We're not going to do that. What say you? But Dr. Peter Kwasniewski. Yes, yes. In fact, I just published an article about that a couple of days ago on Wednesday at 1 Peter 5. So you can see all of my arguments there. But my basic answer is no, they shouldn't be asked to do that for the simple reason, two simple reasons. First, that there are many other ways to show their communion with the bishop. If the theory is that everybody should, all the priests should can celebrate the, the chrism mass or, or on, on Holy Thursday to show their unity with the bishop, there are other ways in church tradition to do that, even just for them to come to to assist in choir or to receive the holy oils that are consecrated at the, at the chrism mass uh, or to pray for the bishop in the canon of the mass. These are all signs of their unity with the bishop. Nobody who really was schismatic with the bishop would do any of these things. Right, yeah. Um, secondly, because canon law, canon 902, is very clear that, that the church gives a permission to concelebrate not not a permission to celebrate mass privately or or singular, singularly, but to but the permission is to <clears throat> celebrate. So you're allowed to celebrate, but you don't ever have to. And the canon law is absolutely clear about this. So unless canon law is changed, which unfortunately in this pontificate it seems like canon law as well as the catechism get changed whenever somebody decides <laughs> that they want to do things in a different direction. But but if canon law is the way it is and it has always been that way, um, ever since celebration started then no priest should be forced against his will or even asked against his will to concelebrate. Um, there are other reasons too that I go into in that article. You know, yeah, Dr. Dr. Kovnetsky, you know, I was really encouraged by, I saw your article 
on uh, ultramontanism, and I was uh, I had become very enamored. I've fallen in love with Doctor uh, with Professor Plenio Correa de Oliveira, and uh, when I saw your article out on ultramontanism, and then you kind of tone back on that idea um, that ultramontanism was bad. I was very uh, impressed by your humility to be able to take a step back from that and kind of move to the language of like a hyper montanism or a hyper papalism. Uh, I thought it was very interesting. Yes, exactly. And I just wanted to share, if I can just really quickly share um, my screen with you. Yes, uh, let me. I don't know how, I'll how give you well, permission. well this is going to work, but I'm going to try it anyway. Um, share screen. Uh, tell me if you can see this. Yes. Yeah. Okay, this is, I've got a new work coming out. It's coming out any day now. It's in two volumes. They can be read separately or together. Uh, that is, they don't have to be read, both of them, but they can, they go together. Um, and you can see what this is about, the road from hyperpapalism to Catholicism. Um, so, it's coming out and it goes into all these questions in a way that I think is very easy for people to understand and, and very practical. When so, is this releasing? Um, probably like in a week or two. Oh, oh well, we're going to have to have you back just to talk about that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, for sure. That's good. So if, if I mean, if you want to know how to find, I mean, if you look, it'll be on my, I'll mention it on my website. And of course it will be, um, I'll mention it on my Facebook page. So yeah, I think this is a, a very important topic because, you know, our, our core audience isn't traditional Catholics. Our core audience on Catholic Radio is the suburban Catholic. Exactly. And, you know, so, and for most of them, this is all red pilling kind of thing. You know, they're just like yeah. Yeah. head blown, like, what? What? We don't exactly. have to do everything the Pope dreams up and decides on a whim. Yes. And, um, yes. How could it be possible yeah, it, that popes would say things that are crazy? I mean, exactly. let alone your really local church, bishop, your priest, or whatever. That's really where church history is so helpful, because one can see that there have been times when popes have gone off the rails. Not many times. I mean, as I point out, the vast majority of popes have been good. That gives us confidence in the institution. A certain number of them have been bad. That, that makes us wary, right? In other words, you, have to, you should be both trusting and intelligent, right? Discerning. Yeah. You have to be discerning and you have to be trusting. Yes. At least, so, so that your default position should be, I will obey unless I see something which really bothers my conscience, you know? Yeah. And then we have to ask what's going on there. Right. Um, yeah, I, Dr. K, I know I, when I was in the novitiate, I, the reason why I ended up leaving was actually because they had asked that the novices become extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion. And I was like, that would violate my conscience. I don't think I'm, I'm able to do that. And so yes. I, they said, if yes. I can't be obedient in that manner, then I should consider leaving. And so that was the, the reason why I left. And so, yeah, I mean, that whole idea of obedience, I think it's, yeah. it's very serious, especially in, a, yeah, in religious you were, life. You were right to, to leave over that because there's absolutely no excuse for extraordinary mm -hmm. ministers. I mean, yeah. even like I've done a full study of everything the Vatican has ever said about this question. And 99% of the cases when they're used are unnecessary. Mm, yeah. you know? So, I mean, I think they're never really necessary. But even if you take strictly what's said, they're usually not. Uh, they, they don't. Tends to be them. very egregious. And dangerous. Yeah. yeah. Dr. K, I want to get your take on, you know, the SSPX was established under a state of necessity. Do you think that that state of necessity still exists today? Well, you know, the, the state of necessity argument um, is... It's it's a slippery kind of argument. It's it's actually kind of, it's not all. It, it, that is, a little bit like appeals to the common good. Mm -hmm. People are going to disagree about what a state of necessity right. looks like, what an emergency really is. However, that being said, um, I would say if now is not a state of necessity, I don't even know what one. Would look like. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> what would one yeah. look like? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, like like would the world would would it be only like in a nuclear war? Is that what is that what you're talking about <laughs> or, or something? Um, so I think that. I, it seems to me, yes, it seems to me that what I, I think I'm sympathetic to what Lefebvre did um, at the time when he did it because of what he said himself. You know, he said 10 years ago, this was in the mid 70s, he said 10 mm -hmm. years ago, uh, every French bishop was teaching what I'm teaching today. Mm -hmm. And now I'm the only one and I haven't changed. It's all the rest of them. That you changed. know, can I just, uh, okay, there's people, there are super insider fans are kind of hanging out watching this too, just so you know. I think we should make that clear. Um, so, sure. so right now, because we're pre-recording, they're the only ones able to see it. 
and I'm not going to reveal details about the second, uh, the second uh, movie in the Mass of the Ages. However, I want to say one thing, because you're on with us, in that um, one of the questions that's always kind of come up in the back of my mind now that I've gone traditional, uh, it's been a slow process for me to become traditional, but now that I'm here, and Adrian and I have discussed this quite a bit, how do you get the vast majority of Catholics, and I'm, I guess I'm painting with a very wide brush, how do you get the vast majority of Catholics to almost wake up overnight and accept a brand new liturgy like that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't well, know what the percentage of Catholics that did accept it overnight, but it seems like it's pretty high. Yes, it's... So are you saying, how did, how did we get so many like, to accept the you, Novus Ordo? You, I know that there were abuses, liturgical abuses, even before the council. Uh, I yeah. get that. That wasn't like a new thing. It was There was experimentation before the council. But it seems like you get a pretty stark and drastic change from what was the traditional form of the liturgy to what is now the Novus Ordo yes, almost yes. overnight. Right. How did that happen? Okay. So and how did, very, I know, but, more, but not just how it happened. I see. I watched the, the film. I know how yeah, that yeah, part yeah. happened. But how was it accepted? How was it so acceptable to yeah, so where was the many census people people at? <laughs> right. to go, okay. yeah, let's so, go with this? There are a few things that have to be said. First, and most important, it was not accepted by the the millions of Catholics who stopped going to church. Mm -hmm. And that's a fact, right? I mean, the most basic form of active participation is to show up. And a lot of Catholics just stopped showing up to Mass. And statistically speaking, the decline in church attendance from the mid-60s to, to the present, really, but, but from the mid-60s to the mid-70s, I would say, was the biggest decline that the church had seen since the Protestant revolt, okay? So we're talking about a massive bleeding, a massive hemorrhaging of faithful. That's not a sign of a successful liturgical reform. <laughs> no, That's it's not. That's the first not. thing we have to say. Yeah. The second thing we have to say is that the changes, although they were in some sense overnight, they were also... They took place over a period of about six or seven years. That is to say, from about 1965 or 64, when vernacular began to be introduced, um, when the priests, sometimes not everywhere, turned around and faced the people. But the rest of the Mass was sort of like the Tridentine Mass, you know, and there was still chant being done in some places. And then, you know, guitars came in shortly after that. Um, and then the Novus Ordo came in after that. There was enough of a, there was just enough that it was like the frogs boiling in water. That is, if you if you thought as a Catholic, I should just go along with what the Pope, the bishops, and the and my pastor are saying and doing, it wasn't a 180 degree, 180 degree turn. It was sort of like a 10 degree turn and then a 20 degree turn and then a 30 degree turn, right? So by the time you got to the full on Novus Ordo completely in the vernacular with the secular music and whatever, by that time, Catholics who had stuck around, they were just kind of like, oh, what the hell? You know, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> Like, we'll just, okay, we'll just go along with this. Um, and some of them, we have to remember, some minor a minority, but a substantial minority, had been, they had drunk the Kool-Aid. They, they had been convinced by the rhetoric that the church was sort of musty, dusty, medieval, out of date, irrelevant, out of touch, and had to be updated. You know, there was this great moment where the Holy Spirit was pushing the church into the modern age, and this was going to reap such great fruits. The people who believed that, they were clapping along with everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think we have to recognize there were the Catholics who were disgusted and left. There were the Catholics who didn't like it, but just stuck around because they thought, I have to be faithful, I have to go along with this. And then there were the Catholics who were happy, clappy, excited about it, right? Um, and what I think this really points to is there was such a false paradigm of pay, pray, and obey, right? That, that the, the Catholics didn't really, most of them didn't have the capacity or the resources to say, wait a minute, something is wrong here for this reason, this reason, this reason, and this reason, right? I mean, Catholics, lay Catholics should just be able to go to church and worship God and not have to become like mini theologians. Right. right. I mean, yes. Yeah. Just, you know, yeah. th this is true. They shouldn't, we shouldn't have to become canon lawyers. You exactly. Know, just to navigate our way through it's modern homeschooling life. moms that have to know the Council of Trent Catechism for crying out exactly. loud. Now, now, God brings good out of evil, right? So if he makes us all into theologians who appreciate canon law, then that's a, probably a good thing, too. You know? mm -hmm. It's the age of the laity, after all. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> but all right. it's at the same time, I think it's scandalous because it's not the homeschool mom's vocation to, yes. to, uh, mm -hmm. to fact check the pope or the bishop right. or what have exactly. you. 
And it's exactly. a distract, and now it's a distraction to her vocation because she has to spend yes. valuable time, or, or the homeschool dad, or what have you. You know, it's just like now right. we're we have to we have to uh, trust but verify. You know, and yes. it's yeah. it's ridiculous. Yeah, no, it's it's really it's a shame. I mean, it's a terrible situation. It's a scandalous situation. Um, but you know, I, I've I've long ago I, I came to the realization that you know history history has always been messy it, to one degree or another. And God just puts us into whatever situation we're in. We have to be realists and we have to be pragmatists and not, and not just, and not complain that this, that there's a meltdown going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. There is a meltdown going on. It's, it's because of modernism. Modernism has been in the church for 150 years. Uh, actually not quite that long, but, but for a long time, uh, and mo and modernist ideas have percolated to such an extent that practically every high prelate in the church is a modernist, whether he realizes it or not. Mm -hmm. um, and once you see that, you just you just say, okay, well, the Lord is clearly, you know, he, there's a very long leash on which he on which the church is kept, in terms of like the gates of hell not prevailing. What what that means, in my opinion, is that the church would be obliterated from the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. That's what it would mean for the gates of hell to prevail. You know, it doesn't mean everything's going to be like a fairyland, you know, fantasy land, you know, perfection, right? No, that's not what it means. The gates of, you know, hell is going to, <clears throat> God is going to let the devil <clears throat> ransack the church, but he will not be able to erase the true faith from the earth. He will not be able to erase the sacraments. And I think we can see in the reaction of Traditios Custodes that the Holy Spirit has raised up so many faithful and clergy in defense of tradition. I mean, it's been this tremendous, almost like a brave heart moment, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Uh, and that's great. We can see how the Holy Spirit is working in that. Yeah, that's amazing. I'm just like, I, you know, when I was, because when I was in the novitiate, we would talk about obedience and the idea of obedience was, you know, we had to be, we had to not only we had, were we to be obedient, we were to be joyful in our obedience. We had to anticipate the uh, orders of our superior. So if we knew that this would probably be the way he would want us to do this something, then we should do it. And we saw this during the, um, the lockdowns that our priests were like anticipating, you know, well, my bishop didn't tell me I had to do X, but it, I kind of know he wanted me to do X. So out of obedience, I need to do that. Yes. Yeah, no, I mean, the, like, I think the COVID period, I uh, talk about divine providence, right? I mean, the, the COVID period exposed the extent to which most of the bishops and many priests were had become almost like automatons. Like they, they were no longer thinking about the truths of the faith and the good of the faithful and the need for the sacraments. They were just thinking about this, what some have called the sanitary dictatorship. You know? mm -hmm. And they, they weren't even doing their homework to be able to see, oh, this is being totally blown out of proportion. Everybody, look, we can all forgive people for the first three months or so. When we thought this is the black death, people are going to be dropping in the streets, whatever. And when that stopped, when that, when it was clear that that wasn't going to happen and still has never, and nothing like it has ever happened, <clears throat> then there should have been an instant reversal on all kinds of, of things. Exactly. Right? Um, and so I, I think we can, you know, it's really been an, exp I think it's been a wake up call for all of us. Like, wow, I guess we really thought that our spiritual good, that our salvation was the number one priority for the church on earth, but I guess it isn't. And so <laughs> if, if that's the case, then we need to do some serious rethinking of our priorities, you know? Yeah. And, and that's what I think, that's what I think has led to the doubling of traditional congregations, mm. right? Mm. Because people could go and receive communion on the tongue. They could receive communion period. Yeah. You know, they could be, they could, they were treated like believing Catholics by the traditional clergy and no, by nobody else. Right. No wonder why all these places are standing room only. Yeah, and they are. <laughs> and uh, that's been one of my chief complaints is can they go back to the suburban parishes now? They're really getting in the way of me getting to confession in a more timely fashion. Okay. <laughs> Yikes. Joe. And my parking lot is a little fuller now than I would like. If you people could go back to your church. I'm teasing. I'm only teasing. Yeah, no, I know. I know. Uh, let, me, let me bring up one point, though, that I think is uh, related to, the, to all of what we've been talking about here. And this is a trend that we are seeing more and more uh, now under the uh, 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 Pope Francis uh, pontificate. And that is bishops that rock the boat get deposed and they get just put out into the pasture. They don't get reassigned. They just go into retirement like the guy in Puerto Rico recently. There was also yes. a gentleman up in, uh, I think, Ma Minnesota. There was the guy in Tennessee. I mean, there's a whole list of these bishops that thanks, but no thanks. Have a great day. They don't get formally charged with any crimes. 
They're not right. prosecuted in any way. They're, they yes. aren't defrocked. They're just right. now bishops hanging out there doing who yes. knows what. Yes. Uh, what do we make right. of that? Right. Well, I mean, I think I think what's obvious is that, you know, these are the these are the techniques or the tactics of author, authoritarian governments, autocratic governments. Right. People just disappear. Inconvenient people disappear. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's that is scandalous because um, I, I wrote this article for Catholic Family News called Is the Pope the Vicar of Christ or the CEO of Vatican Inc? Mm. Um, <laughs> and and it's talking about the Bishop Torres situation in Puerto Rico where he it's 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 clear from the entire uh history of it that he's never been charged with any wrongdoing. He's never done anything wrong according to canon law or according to moral theology. But just because he wouldn't go along with the policies of the other bishops in Puerto Rico um, and in, in matters in which a bishop is totally free, he's been he's been deposed against his will. And he specifically said, I refuse to resign. So he was deposed. Right. I mean, this is something this is incredible. It's insane. Um, but, you know, what it shows, again, is the auto autocratic or dictatorial methods used by uh, an ideological party. Um, and, and that's again, is this helpful? I think it is helpful because it's a red pill moment for people. Um, one would what, hope, you know, it, it's, it's not a good thing. I mean, I'm not trying to put a silver lining on the cloud. It's just bad, but, um, but it, it's good in a way if it helps us to recognize, um, that, you know, that we're basically living under a pornocracy. I mean, mm. this is what, this is what Timothy Flanders says. You know, if you, if you go and look at his articles at one Peter five on, if you type in pornocracy, one Peter five, um, he talks about the fact that the church has had certain very dark periods in the past that were, and th there was one, well, you could really say the first pornography was at the end of the first millennium. Uh, the second was at the time of the Renaissance, you know, leading right up to the Reformation. And then the third is the present situation. Hmm. And these are periods when, when the Lord in his, in his mysterious designs is allowing the Catholic Church on earth to experience a tremendous darkness um, in her leadership. You know, yeah, um, and that's and we, you know, this is this is an incentive for prayer and fasting and for, and for just fidelity, right? It's a call to to fidelity. Awesome, you know, Doctor K. We'll we'll let you uh, take yeah, off. But I just go. had a question, uh, real quick, about what is in your book. Uh, uh, do you cover in this book that's about to come out? Uh, do you cover the set of vacantes and set of privationist uh, opinions on the papacy? Yes. Awesome. Yeah, no, I, I awesome. respond to the conservative hyperpapalists. I respond to the state of contests. I mentioned state of privationism. Um, you know, I talk about, uh, like, you know, the what exactly does Vatican I teach and what does it not mm. teach? Um, so, yeah, it, it covers, like, pretty much all the hot button issues. Why, why do you keep bringing up Vatican I, Dr. Peter Kwasniewski? I mean, the council. <laughs> there's, only, mean, there's only been one council. There's just the council. <laughs> And you keep bringing up all this old stuff. Vatican II, no... Vatican II <laughs> trademark over the... Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny because uh, it, even the fact that we say Vatican II suggests that it's a sequel to something. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> you and your facts. Good Going grief. To return of... <laughs> right, exactly. Well, God bless you, uh, Dr. Peter Kwasniewski. Thanks for hanging out with us even longer than we expected and uh, oh, giving sure. us even more conversation. We appreciate that. And that was just a special extra to our CDT insiders that are hanging out with us today, but uh, have a great day. God bless you. We're, we're signing off. We're going to our weekend now. Hopefully your yeah, weekend will be good too. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. God bless. Bye. Thank you. God bless you.